Exodus 25, 9. When you get there, say something. Exodus 25, 9. Thanks, God, for these musicians. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Exodus 25, 9. It reads, in 27 minutes and 33 seconds I have, and I'm going to pay attention to it today. God tells Moses, build this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly according to the pattern that I will show you. Amen. Build this tabernacle and all of its furnishings, he says, exactly according to the pattern I will show you. Worship. Through the processes of the tabernacle, worship. Within certain Jewish circles, there are rabbis that have, have uh, various customs, depending on the sect, will determine the custom that they have. There are things that are universal, but there are other sects. There are sects of rabbis that interpret scripture and preparation for encounter with God differently. There's a practice I've been made aware of recently of some, if you're taking notes, the rabbis who do what they would call inclining their heart toward God. Right, let me try this side. There are rabbis, Jewish rabbis, teachers leaders within their, within their community who practiced particularly a few thousand years ago and on from that point what they called inclining their heart toward God. There was actual preparation before they ever uttered a word of prayer. Interestingly, our first mode of interaction with God is that we just enter into prayer to encounter him. We, we, just, we, just, we just have a little talk with Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. But as I studied this custom, I realized that for us, really, there's not as much room for it. We don't understand the importance of it. And so we often come into interaction with God without setting the intention of our heart or the intention of our mind. These rabbis would incline their heart toward God for an hour before they ever opened up their mouth to utter a word of prayer. Somebody in this place said, I can't tell you when I prayed for an hour, <laughs> let alone preparing my heart, preparing my mind, my psyche, Preparing my, my, my spiritual condition to communicate or commune with God. I mean, wh where do we do that? We, we, not an indictment, we're all guilty, but we just, we just roll up in the house of God. Fresh off of an argument <laughs> with our husbands and our wives. If you, if you don't giggle, I know it's you. Just giggle. <laughs> and, and when we walk into the house of God, it is, it is the task or the job. It's your job, praise team. It's, it's your job, pastor, to, to, to usher us into the presence of God. Okay, okay we got you. We got you. We got you. We, 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 we have inclined our hearts. We've prepared the way uh, to, to, to minister in song before you. I've, I've looked over a few notes and prayed before I walked in this place and, and, and planned to, to, 
uh, lead you uh, progressively toward what God would have for you. But the reality is that lifting is too heavy because there is a task on your part. There is preparation on your part. There is a need to incline your heart and to set your expectation toward God. Because in the hour and 15 minutes or so that we have together, uh, if you don't create some sort of preparation to incline your heart toward God, we spend most of our time in this service inclining your heart toward God. And by the time you get good and ready to receive something from the Lord, it's time to go. Are you still here with me? And that has nothing to do just with the time frame that we worship in. It has nothing to do with the length of time that we keep you. It is that we have not been taught that there is preparation for encounter. Question, what, what do you do? I know you pray. Sometimes. But in the event that you do pray, what do you do to prepare your heart to pray? I, I, I know you worship. Hallelujah. Question is, what is your preparation? Not that you cannot enter instantaneously into worship. Not that you cannot in, in, enter instantaneously, in, instantaneously into prayer. But we're talking about, again, the third dimension. We're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're talking about a deep, rich, meaningful encounter with God. Many of us are frustrated with our encounter with God. And the missing link for us is that there is no preparation for the encounter. We attempt to jump from the outer courts into a deep experience and wonder why it's not coming together the way we expect it to come together. These rabbis, as they incline their heart toward God, as they prepared for prayer, as they prepared for worship, even if they weren't the rabbis, there is a picture in the mind of every person who understands the custom. They're, they're, it is set into their custom. The idea of interaction or preparation with the Almighty. I, I, I think we in our generation, there, there are benefits to, to phrases like and concepts like it's not about religion, it's about relationships. It, it's not about form and fashion. It's about organic encounter. No, no, no. I, I'm with you all on the same page. We, we, we don't prescribe things that the Bible does not prescribe. We don't put heavy yokes of custom on people just because we like the tradition. Are you still here with me? But, but I feel like, it, just, just indulge me for a moment. I, I feel like we lost a little something when if everything just became casual. And I, hey, it's me again, God. You know, it's just uh, it, when things became so, not that God is not relational, not that he does not connect with us, but, but it got a little casual. The Bible does talk in the New Testament epistles about an undefiled religion. Are you with me? It does, in a, a positive light, talk about the things that do bring us into greater encounter with God. But we've become so user-friendly and so organic. The good part of us being organic is that we can relate to God naturally. The challenge with us being organic is sometimes we don't employ the things that bring us into a deeper encounter with God, but we want the depth that comes with that kind of preparation. Bartleman, one of the great Azusa Street revivalists and, 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 and historians of the Azusa Street revival says that we want the see, we want the results of revival without planting the seeds for revival. And I've discovered in our churches, we want the results of an intimate relationship with God. We want the results of a deep worship without inclining our hearts or laying the proper foundations of the seeds that cause us to experience that type of worship. And so as we walk through this tabernacle, I don't want you to just say, oh, I, I, I heard that the first time. 
I don't want you to just look at this process and mark it off of your list of things to do because you have mental mastery of this. I want you to begin to think about the process. At the end, there is this deep, meaningful, rich encounter with God, the Ark of the Covenant, the manifest presence of God, the kind of presence of God that shows up and transforms circumstance and transforms mindsets and transforms ideas. But the challenge is, for, the, for, for us, we don't mentally walk down through the process to determine why we're being robbed of our meaningful encounter. To them, they didn't have that challenge. As they worshiped or attempted to connect with God, they may have, as Jesus said, lacked some of the spirit part, but at least the truth, the foundation of the truth was established in them. They could not, listen, they did not understand Simple encounter with God without having these stations in mind. We don't have time to go through it. I don't have time to do any review today. In the few moments that I have to close this thing out, because we're done with this today. I'm tired of hearing myself talk about it. <laughs> Four Sundays, long enough for a series. But the idea is that each one of these stations, the altar, salvation, I cannot have rich experience without first going, Christ says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm the door. You can't lock the door and still have the joys of being in the house. Are you still here with me? He says, I am the way. I still believe it. Number two, he says, the next thing you came in contact with was the laver, which represents repentance. I cannot at the same time harness the spirit of God and go deeper in an encounter with him while simultaneously harnessing ratchet plans. It is impossible because when the presence, the manifest presence of God draws near, it always requires some sort of a decision to be made. Note in the vision that the prophet had or the encounter that the prophet had. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his glory filled the temple. And when the Bible creates this picture of the, 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 the angels crying out to one another, it says with two wings, they veiled their face. With two wings, they veiled their feet. With two wings, they did fly. And they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now notice in this encounter with the manifest presence of the Lord what happens to the prophet. Prophet. He says immediately, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst people with unclean lips. When I see God for who he is, and he manifests himself to me, I cannot see God without seeing myself. Are you still here with me? I cannot see God without seeing what in me has to shift in order to maintain a deeper encounter with him. Look at your neighbor tell him, I need to laugh, I need to repent. Yeah, I want to go deep. You want, you want us to blow your mind every week, but you don't want to repent. You want the praise team to have you on your face every week, but you don't want to repent. There are certain breakthroughs you're not going to get no matter what church you go to, no matter what atmosphere you're in. The glory could be falling around you, but as long as you're holding on to things you don't want to let go of, it'll hopscotch right over you. Are you with me? You have to make this decision whether you will yield to the Spirit, embrace the Spirit, or hold on to what it is you've been holding on to. Uh, look at your neighbor and tell them it's not your church. It may be. <laughs> if you want to have some attitude, just look at them and tell them, maybe you, boo-boo. Uh, number three. I feel like I need to get that out. Candlesticks. I cannot have this rich encounter unless I have the encounter or being led or, or interacting with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what makes this encounter then I need to come in contact with the table of shoe bread that represents the pra praise, I mean, excuse me, represents the word of God. In order, listen, in order to encounter God at that level, I must understand the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord gives me the foundations, the roots. It, it grounds me. It ensures that I don't drift into error. The word of the Lord gives me understanding concerning the encounters that I'm 
having. It ensures that I don't get some weird, freaky manifestation. Are you with me? But like the apostles, when the Holy Spirit hit and people looked at him and said, those men are drunk. Peter stood up and said, no, I'm not drunk. This is that. The this is the experience we're having. The that is what's in the word. He said, this is that that the prophet Joel spoke of. This is that which is in the word. You ought to be able to tell people about your this. You ought to be able to, to tell them what this is. If you, if you can't tell them what this is, if you can't find any pattern for this, it may or may not be God. But, but what allows you to know that it's God is when you're able to say, this is that. The scripture spoke of. Today's lesson. Last one. Two stations. Is the altar of incense. I love it today. It's my favorite right now. I'm telling you right now. They went from station to station in an attempt to get to the deep, rich, meaningful, manifest presence of the Lord. This altar of incense represents a few things. Interestingly, every other station represented probably one thing. This altar of incense represented a few things. Here's what it represented. Altar of incense represents prayer, praise, and worship. Now, notice the compatibility here. The Holy Spirit is what shines light on the table of shoe bread. The candlestick shines light on the table of shoe bread. The next station is the altar of incense. The Holy Spirit is what shines light on the word of God so that it's not just words, but it's illuminated for us. The word of God gives us the basics in our understanding of how we encounter or connect with God. The altar of incense, notice this, after I understand the basics in connecting love on God, in theory, the next station is the altar of incense where I now begin to experientially practice what I read about in theory. In the Bible, I'm learning about prayer, praise, and worship. It is at the altar of incense. The next logical step is that the prayer, praise, and worship I just learned about, I ought to be doing. I wish I could camp out right there, but I got to go on because we have 10 minutes and 37 seconds. But can I tell you the Western church is obsessed with what they know from the table? While I celebrate celebrating the word of God. Has anybody ever asked the question, what has he given us the word for? After all, has he given us the word to know some more stuff? Or has he given us the word so that we may know some more stuff, so that we can do maybe a little bit of the stuff that we do know? This is why you should never roll your eyes if you heard a mess. I heard that before. Um, I knew I shouldn't have come this Sunday. I felt it in my spirit. But if we did a check to see how much of what you already know you're incorporating, we would put our finger up and walk out of this place from embarrassment. Are you still here with me? If we did a quarter of what we already know to do, you would transform every environment that you walk into. The issue is not of knowledge. The issue is of the application that follows the knowledge. So our goal in studying the word is not just to know more or to add more to our mental Rolodex, but our goal in studying the word is so that we're interacting with him and we're prepared to righteously connect 
connect with him, to righteously pray according to his word, to righteously praise, and to accurately worship. I need the word to understand what to pray for. I need the word to understand how to pray. I need the word to understand the difference in between a petition, are you with me, and thanksgiving. I need the word to help me as it relates to the dynamics of prayer. I need the word to help me with praise, and I need the word to frame my worship for me. But there comes the time where I move from just knowing about it in theory to experiencing it in practice, and that's the altar of incense. Now, now here, here, here's where it gets fun. Altar of incense, interestingly, has three stations from pray, prayer to praise to worship. Prayer to praise to worship. The, the altar of incense would be lit and it would fill the entire holy place with smoke. It represents our prayer sent up to God. Our praise sent up to God. And our worship sent up to God as the incense filled the sanctuary, or the, tent, the holy place, with smoke. It represents our prayer, our praise, and our worship. Now follow me. Interestingly, this is beautiful, and God is trying to give us a message that you missed through the way that he lays this tabernacle out, and particularly the way that he deals with this altar of incense. This entire tabernacle from outer court to holy of holies is a progression. Say progression. <laughs> well, let me help you out real quick. Uh, uh, the altar of incense is not only part of that progression. It is uh, a progression in and of itself. All right, let me see if I can teach you. Every other station, altar, fixed, lever. Fixed. Candlesticks. Same place. Fixed. Table of shoe bread. Fixed. Altar of incense. Fit in the move. <laughs> On the day of atonement, the high priest would take the altar of incense and push it from the holy place once that was filled with smoke into the Holy of Holies. It was the only item when the tabernacle was stationary that would move from one dimension into the next dimension or move from one piece of the curtain behind the other curtain into the Holy of Holies. Now, I, I'm not big on using a, a secular examples all the time. I do it from time to time. But uh, you, you, you've, you've heard of blessing on blessing on blessing, uh, some of you. I don't know if you do. I uh, just, just want to make sure some of them saved longer than others. Blessing on blessing on blessing. Uh, but, but have you ever heard of uh, progression on progression on progression? Here, here's the progression. I I want you to see it. It's threefold. And whenever God does something threefold, he is trying to get our attention. Whenever God does something threefold, he gives us insight into the fact that this has significance at every level of our being. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. Mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and soul. Are you still here with me? Hold up your three real quick. A tabernacle. Outer court. Inner court. Holy of holies. Now, I want you to see something. Whenever God does something in threes, he is setting up a pattern to put an emphasis to draw our attention somewhere. Now, every other thing is fixed, but notice the progression. Not only did the altar of incense move from the holy place into the holy of holies, that's one progression. It was part of the tabernacle, which is a progression in and of itself from the outer court all the way to the inner court. But the third thing is it's a progression within itself because you move from prayer to praise to worship. Whenever there is a progression, and there are three here, God wants us to take note of it. I wish I had time to work that and tell you how that is God's divine signature on what he wants us to pay attention to. So there's something significant about this altar of incense. What is it? I'm so glad you're so concerned to ask me. Uh, the altar of incense is significant in that, I'll tell you in a minute, the outer court was where the majority of the people were. The inner court thinned the crowds to the priest. 
The Holy of Holies was only for one person, which was the high priest on the Day of Atonement. I wish I had time to work this pattern to show how the progression went deeper and it became more intimate with every step that you went further. I wish I had time to tell you how these three steps also mirror or reflect the three steps that Moses experienced when he went up on the mountain of God. God, I wish I had time. The people stayed in the valley. The priest went up a little bit higher just above the base and Moses only accessed the peak of the mountain where he received the law. It is three. It is progression. Look at your David, tell me it's progression, don't progression, don't progression. Yeah, don't let them backslide, though, when you say that. Now, here's the idea. The idea is that that area or that middle piece was called, follow me if you will, it was called the sanctuary. Not only in the Old Testament, but when we get into the New Testament, that middle area is called the sanctuary. Are you with me? Now, interestingly, all of these stations have a place. Here in the outer court, there is salvation, which is represented by the altar, and repentance, which is represented by the laver. Look at your neighbor, tell them that's personal. All right, now, now skip over the middle place. You get to the end. There is the Ark of the Covenant, where one man, one time a year, experienced the manifest presence of God. Look at your neighbor, tell them that's intimate. Yeah, that's personal. Yeah, yeah. Touch yourself and say personal. Now, interestingly, in between this individual experience at the beginning and this personal experience at the end, there he is in the middle what is called. Okay, I thought I had one AP student. Uh, uh, help me out, y'all, please. Uh, it is, no, no, nobody has a blues clue. Uh, it is, uh, uh, open book test, I already said it. Uh, it is, ah, uh, now you're walking with me. You're not going to make me do all the work today. I promise you that. It is the sanctuary that is in between these two intimate encounters. Are you still here with me? So here's the idea. I'm about to roll because I got a, uh, the, uh, one more service and I got two anniversary services later on tonight. So, so I'm just going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, let me just help you out real quick. Uh, the, the, big, the first court was a personal encounter, salvation and repentance. The last court was a personal encounter with the manifest presence of God. But in between is the... Now, what happens in the sanctuary? In the sanctuary, there is the Holy Spirit, there is the Word, and there is the first stage of praise, worship, prayer, and intercession. Now, I love Antioch. Here's why I love Antioch. We, we tested ourselves out on this. I, I just want to make sure we're in the right place. I, I love this sanctuary because there's some sanctuaries, uh, some worship experiences, and I'm not beating up anybody, but uh, they have good word, but, 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 but the worship, they, there's no worship, and there's no Holy Spirit uh, in, in their movement. The Holy Spirit is not at work. They don't give Holy Spirit the free reign. That they, and then you have some that have, that have, that have the Holy Spirit, but, but you're trying to figure out what, what's going on. Is it biblical? Is it in the Bible? What is going on? Did you just make that up? Was that what God gave you in the car right over? Did you compare? We're Bereans. Did you, did you compare that and look to see whether those things be true. Some people just have a manifestation without the rich encounter with the word of God. Thank God for Antioch. I, I, forgive me. If I, if, if I, if I, if I, I have a problem, I, that'd be very, my, my, I have a short list of places I, I would be a member if, if I wasn't here. Now that's just me. I'm not trying to sell you. You can go wherever you want to go, but for me, it will be tough and because, because there's either a challenge sometimes with the, with the spirit or there's a challenge with the word, but we actually need both. I got to go. The word and the spirit. Are you still here with me? In the the sanctuary. Not only was the word and the spirit in the sanctuary, but here's what you got to do. You got to have pray, prayer, praise, and worship in the sanctuary. Now, the purpose of prayer, praise, and worship in the sanctuary is not your prayer, praise, and worship fix for your life. Let me try this side. They're sleep, dead sleep over there. They're cold over there. Uh, they like me better over here. Let me see if I can help you. The purpose of the prayer, praise, and worship in the sanctuary is not for you to become fixed on the prayer, praise, and worship in the sanctuary. <sighs> the first phase was individual. The last phase was individual. 
The middle phase is corporate. In the corporate gathering, we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. In the corporate gathering, we teach from the word of God so that you know what we're getting excited about. In the corporate gathering, we model, model, model prayer, praise, and worship. But the peak of your encounter with God and the deepening of your walk with God will never, ever grow deeper If the highlight of your prayer, praise, and worship is within the context of the sanctuary. I got to roll out of here, y'all. I can't can't shout today like I want to, but if if I did, I would tell you. It shows us here that, watch the progression. This is the only station that is pushed from the sanctuary into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is and where one man would go into it. Are you with me? What is he trying to show us? He's trying to show us that if we want depth in our encounter with God, our highlight cannot be the sanctuary, but we're just worshiping to show you how we should honor our Lord. We're praying to seek his face, but also to show you how you are to pray. We're giving you the word of God from the table of shoe bread on a regular basis to prep you, to prepare you, to strengthen you, but you have to do some work yourself. The work you need to do is to push. Look at your neighbor, tell them you got to push. Or we can set these stations up for you, but it's your job to push. What do I mean push? you got to take this experience from the sanctuary, and you've got to push it into an intimate place when you're all by yourself. Because sometimes you're going to need the glory of God to fall, and Sunday has not rolled around yet. It's Wednesday. I can't call Pastor Wayne. I can't gather the praise team together. I may not have an organ. I may not have a a piano. But devil, one thing I know how to do, and that is push is not just pray until something happens. Push is bringing my worship encounter and my worship experience into my context. That's it. I'm not going no harder, y'all, today. Don't kill me. No, sir. I want you to get this, though. Listen. Hear me. Here is thank you. I'm glad you love it. If I get about five, ten more people where you are, I want them where you are. (laughs) Progression, progression. Say progression. No, we really have to go right now. We close with this. Pray, prayer, praise, worship. Listen to me. I don't want to beat anybody up because I've been here. Some of us, we've been missing a rich encounter with God. I, I can tell in worship that we've been missing that rich encounter with God. Because we've made the sanctuary the place where we communicate with him the most. Somebody needs to push your prayer into your Monday through Saturday. You've limited it. For somebody in this place, God says, I want to commune with you again. I, I, want, I want you to talk. To, I want, just listen, I know it sounds silly. I know you've been keeping it all up here. No, no, t- tomorrow, wake up. When you wake up, like when you leave this place, just t- turn the radio off. Don't want, no distractions. Just begin to open up your mouth. Say, God, I know it's been a while. I haven't talked to you in a while. Lord, we do it in church, but God, I can't live. I can't survive on my once-a-week experience. But, Lord, I need you to push my prayer into my life. God, I... I Open up, open up your mouth, open up your mouth, open up your mouth, open up your mouth when you leave this place. I know it sounds simple and basic, but we want to just jump in. No, 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 incline your heart. How, how do you incline your heart? You set your heart toward him. And you begin to open up the lines of communication again. Some of you think it's real deep, it's not that deep. 
Some of you just need to talk to them again. And I promise you, I guarantee, there are people in this moment, in this room, the moment that you begin to open up your mouth and speak to him, you're going to feel the glory of God begin to come again. But then he says, progression, we are to praise. Praise. And we're to worship. Praise. Interestingly, I'll enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Into your courts with and it's implied that you go into the house with worship. Because gates and courts don't surround nothing. It is the preparation of the heart to encounter God. And to gates, I, I cannot get to even, I can't even get to my praise until I start to reflect, until I start to praise and thanksgiving go hand in hand. They're, they're almost inseparable. They're, there are nuances that separate thanksgiving from praise. Now, now there, and there are nuances that separate praise from worship, but, but there's a stream that connects all of them together. It, it's not meant for it to be divided up. It's meant to flow from one to another. Now, here's how it works. The moment you begin to thank God, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you don't have. I don't care what money's not in the bank. I don't care what door hasn't opened up for you. I don't care what sickness in your, is in your body. I dare somebody in this place to begin to look back over your life. So you can't praise him without thanking him. You can't praise him without looking back. You can't praise him without thinking about the mountains that he brought you over and the valleys that he's seen you through. As you begin to thank him for the things that he's done, it goes from a cognitive exercise to a spiritual exercise. You feel gratitude begin to well up in your heart. And before you know it, there's a celebration that comes over you as you're lavishing your love toward our enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'll enter into his courts with praise. But here's what I know about God. God, if you're willing to go deeper, God will take it deeper. Try to stop. If you're willing to go deeper, God, most times breakthrough stops because you didn't have time. Most times, breakthrough is cut short because we backed out. But I promise you, if you stay in the face of God and continue through celebration to praise Him, listen, your praise will turn to worship. Your praise will turn to worship. Now, the difference in between praise and worship is not meant to be divided. Look at your neighbor, tell me it's meant to flow. It's flow, flow. It's meant to flow. It's because some have said praise is glorifying God for what he's done and worship is glorifying God for who he is but that's not true because in the Bible God is both praise and worship for who he is and what he did so that's not the differentiating factor the difference between praise and worship in praise and worship, you can use the same words. In praise and worship, your hands can be lifted. Praise and worship, the difference is not a fast song and a slow song, because I can worship God on a fast song, and I can praise God on a slow song. But the difference between praise and worship is not the mechanics by which I approach God and lavish my goodness, or his, good, his goodness back to him and celebrate his goodness. Listen to me. But the difference in between praise and worship is not in what I do, but it's rather in what I experience. Worship means to bow down. Now hear me. Bowing down is not only physical. But bowing down is my will. Bowing down is my spirit. Bowing down is when God comes. Lord, even though I want this, I'd rather have you. And so I bow my will down for your will. Sometimes it's I bow my body down for your will. But it happens, watch this, fluidly as you praise him, as you're praising the Lord, as you're lifting him up. Interestingly, what happens is you're loving on him, you're lavishing it on him, but the encounter deepens. How do you know it's gone from praise to worship? It's gone from praise to worship when you're still glorifying him, but now has a profound effect on you as well. So I'm still telling him that he's good. I'm still celebrating his goodness. But I know I just moved into worship when his presence draws nearer. I know I just moved into worship when an awareness of his presence draws in. I know I've moved into worship when it's gone from me lavishing my love on him to now something's going on with me. 
My experience is changing. My heart is changing. My posture is changing. You know it's worship when something shifts, when something changes, when something bows down. I got to go. But Lord, that you would make us worshipers, that we would know you and worship you in spirit and in truth. If you believe that and want to do it, take a moment now just to thank him. Take a moment just to praise him. Take a moment to worship your king.